Good day, everyone. We are uh, looking at, uh, we're going to look at one passage from Thessalonians where Paul is telling the Thessalonians a little bit about the return of Jesus and how to live in light of the return of Jesus. Now, of course, when we talk about the return of Jesus, there are a lot of things to talk about. Jesus uh, talks about it in, um, in some of the, uh, you can read that in some of the Gospels. And Paul also talks about that in other places. And of course, the book of Revelation is there as well. Uh, so what we're going to look at is just a, a little bit of, about the return of Jesus and something that is particularly, particularly uh, applicable to what Thessalonians are struggling, um, are wrestling with. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at. So it's not a teaching about the whole thing about the return of Jesus. Okay. All right, so around last week, around last week, I read an article titled this. To be more productive, Tim Ferriss suggests a low information diet. Now, I know what diet is, but I don't know what low information diet. So who is Tim Ferriss? I had no idea, but he sure sounds important, right? Anyone knows Tim Ferriss? See? No. Okay, cool. One person raised, oh, yeah? You raise your hands? Cool, all right, one person. One person in the morning at 9 a.m., so another person in 11.15, all right. So he's quite well known. Okay, anyway. Um, well, I, I did check. He's actually the author of the book, a book titled Four Hour Work Week. So that's quite intriguing, right? But since he himself suggests a low information diet, I decided I'm not going to read his book, right? So too much information. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, the article, not the book, the article, the article started with this. Here is a radical idea. You know too much. I thought, how do you know? Anyway, you know too much. <laughs> sure, some knowledge is important, but how much of what you know really has an impact on your life? Now think about that for a second. How much of what you know really has an impact on your life? If you're honest, probably not much. Uh, these are some of the headlines in one of my news feeds last Wednesday. Um, one headline says, Astrophysicists have discovered planets outside our galaxy for the first time. This math problem appeared on an 1869 MIT admissions test. Calico cats are almost always female. There is a plasma engine that can get up to Mars in 40 days. Now, there are some of them. Are they cool? Yeah, I think they're cool. Is it good to know? Perhaps. But did they change your life at all? Probably no, unless you are fans of calico cats, probably no, right? <laughs> Chances are you will live your life exactly the same as you have been. But of course, from time to time, you encounter an, inf in, an information that does change your life. I bumped into this article just this week. Sit-ups are risky. <laughs> Try these core exercises instead. Now, because I'm an avid bodybuilder, right, I decided to read. <laughs> So the article says that sit-ups have proven to be a big injury risk. Listen, okay. According to Dr. Stuart McGill, professor of spine biomechanics, sit-ups and crunches place up to 340 kilograms of compressive force on the spine. You see, that's why I'm always hesitant about sit-ups. <laughs> I knew something is fishy about sit-ups, right? So, and the article says that instead of sit-ups, Trainers and physicians are recommending planks to help people build stronger core. So will I start doing planks? Maybe, but I think I better wait for a new article that says planks are risky. Okay? Because I'm a very careful person, you see? But, well, my point is back to where I started. Some information are life-changing, but some are just not life-changing. How much of what you know really has an impact on your life? Now, in today's passage, Apostle Paul started with this. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about something. Now, Paul did not have the luxury of internet, chat apps, Facebook messengers, and paper was not even available widely. He wrote on papyrus. It was rather costly, and it was very limited in terms of availability. So when he decided to write a letter, he, need, he must think carefully what he wanted to say. He cannot just... Blah, just in your WhatsApp, perhaps you just say whatever you want to say. You can't do that. So what he's going to say in this passage is super important, really matters to the Thessalonians. Now, of course, the whole letter is important, but there is a reason, I think, why Paul began this section with this. 
And we shall see that what he's going to say, well, it does have a huge impact to our life as well. So what is it that Paul wanted the Thessalonians to know? He basically is answering three questions that the Thessalonians have. The three questions are this, so you can follow along in your, uh, in your church uh, paper. The first one is, what about the dead? When Jesus returns, what happens to those who are already dead? Secondly, when is he coming back anyway? And thirdly, what shall we do now? How should we live now? So, firstly, about what about the dead? What about the dead? Now, in my hometown, there is a quite well-known breakfast place. They sell this thing called Soto Banjar. Anyone knows? Anyone from Indonesia knows? Yeah, someone knows? Oh, yeah, from Kalimantan. No worries. Okay. Yeah. Soto Banjar. Banjar is a, is a tribe name or a name of a region in South Kalimantan. I'm from East Kalimantan. And it's a basically, a Soto is a spiced chicken soup. Different region in Indonesia has different kinds of Soto. So it's basically a spiced chicken soup with compacted rice or ketupat or lontong um, and vermicelli, potato fritter, chicken, boiled eggs with lime and chili. It's so yummy. Woo All right. We don't have church lunch today, but go and find yourself. I don't know if they sell Soto Banjar in Melbourne. I've never found it yet. Anyway, during school days, now, during school days, we kids, uh, when we were young, we don't get to eat there because we had to go to school early. Uh, in Indonesia, school starts at 7 o'clock. So during school days, we can't go there. But during school holidays, one of the things that I always wanted to do was to have breakfast there. Now, one day, my dad promised to bring us to that Soto Banjar place. So he said, we'll go there tomorrow morning, school holiday. Ooh, so I was excited. But during holiday, of course, another thing that we love to do is to sleep in. So you know where this story is going. The next morning, I woke up. To my surprise, all my four siblings are no longer in the bedroom, and the sun was so bright. I got up, I ran to the kitchen downstairs, and to my dismay, nobody was home. Everybody had gone. And a bit later, they came home and brought me a takeaway of that soto. I was so upset. Okay? You, 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 <laughs> <laughs> eating soto banya on a porcelain bowl, hot soup, compared to a lukewarm in a plastic container is very different. And I asked, why did you not wake me up? And my mom said, you're very fast asleep. We didn't want to disturb you. I thought, if there was a time to disturb me in my sleep, <laughs> this would be it. I was so upset and angry, I did more things that I don't want to say here, but literally, because literally I was left behind when I was sleeping. And from then on, of course, I thought to myself, uh, to myself I'll make sure that I'm awake next time they plan to eat Soto Banjar. Well, why am I telling this story? Well, it's, it's quite similar to what the Thessalonians were upset about. They know Jesus will return. They were waiting in anticipation. So they made sure that they were awake when Jesus returns. They look forward to the day when death is no more. However, apparently Jesus did not return soon enough. So gradually, their uncles passed away, some of their friends passed away, some of their Christian friends, some of, some, maybe some parents died as well. They were so upset and they thought, when Jesus returns, these people who have died, these people who are no longer awake, they will be left behind. They could not have... They're soto banjar in heaven, right? So what will happen to them? They will be left behind. But to this, Paul tells them, don't be silly. Don't be ignorant. And Paul comforts them. Paul comforts them, not with a pat in the back, but with the truth. So he comforts them with three truths. Firstly, the God who raised Jesus from the dead can raise those who have died. The first thing he said, for since... We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now, the word fallen asleep here is, a, is an euphemism, a softer term to refer to death, to refer to those who have died. Now, we know that Jesus' death on the cross is to pay for our sins. We know that his sacrifice on the cross is the guarantee that we don't have to uh, suffer eternal condemnation uh, because he has taken our place. But he did not stay dead. If he stayed dead, then we, we also don't have the hope that one day we will, be risen, we will be raised. But because he did not stay dead, 
he shows that when Jesus rose from the dead, he shows that death is not the end. We sang just now the song, the tomb, the tomb where the soldiers watched in vain was only borrowed for three days. And then the body does not remain there anymore. The tomb is empty. Because of that, Paul tells them, those who have died, no problem. They will rise again. They will not miss out. Don't worry. And secondly, he says that those who, have, those who are alive do not have any advantage over those who are dead. Those who are alive do not have the front, front row seats when Jesus returns. In fact, in verse 15, Paul says that we who are alive will not precede those who have died. And in verse 16, he says the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who are alive do not have the head start over those who are already dead. And thirdly, everyone will meet Jesus together. It doesn't matter whether you are alive or whether you are dead when he returns. No one will be left behind. First Thessalonians verse 4, 16, 17 says, The dead in Christ will rise first. Though Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet, with, to meet the Lord in, in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So Paul tells them three truths. Paul wants them to know these three things. That's why he says, Brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. But there's a reason. Their information is not just for information's sake, but so that they may not grieve as others who do not have hope. So they may not grieve as others who have no hope. Paul wanted to know these thr truths so that they, they don't grieve like other people who do not know Jesus. Now, of course, can we Christians grieve over the death of our loved ones? Of course we can. We should. We must. Because death is still a painful experience. Death is a painful reminder of our sinful state. Losing your loved one is never, never easy. And Jesus himself wept for Lazarus when, when Lazarus died. So it's okay to grieve. But Paul tells them you can grieve, but don't grieve like those who have no hope. There's a difference. You grieve over them, but you must know that one day you will see them again and together you will meet Christ in the air. That's why Paul says in the end of chapter 4, he says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The word encourage here is the present imperative, which means keep on encouraging. Keep on encouraging. So as brothers and sisters in Christ, we must keep on encouraging one another with these truths. Whether you do it aggressively or gently, but you need to encourage one another with this truth. Jesus is coming back, and the same God who raised Jesus from the dead will raise those who have died, and He will bring all of us together to meet Jesus. And that is our hope. That is our hope. Therefore, Christians can and must approach death differently from those who do not know Jesus. We can grieve, but we must not grieve like those who have no hope. Because for Christians, death is not goodbye. For Christians, death should be, see you again. So that's the first question that he answers. The second question is this, when is he coming back? Now, of course, they are asking this partly because, again, many of their Christian brothers and sisters that they know are dying. So they became a bit impatient. They thought, people are dying here. Hello, where are you, when are you coming? If you're not coming soon enough, we will die as well. So that's why they ask, when is he coming back? Now, the desire to know exactly when Jesus will return is quite tempting because in our minds, well, we need to know. We need to be, we need to be prepared, right? Many, many people actually have attempted this. Uh, one prediction uh, was done by three theologians called Hippolytus of Rome, Julius of Africanus, and Irenaeus. They predicted that Jesus would return in the year 500. And, and the prediction was based on the dimensions of Noah's Ark. I have no idea how they calculated that, but that's what happened. In, back in 16th century, a, mathem a mathemati mathematician named Michael Stifel calculated that the Judgment Day would begin at 8 a.m. on 19th October 1533. Another one in 19th century, a Baptist preacher, William Miller, proclaimed that Jesus Christ will return to earth by 22nd of October 1844, based on his study of the prophecy in Daniel chapter 8. And of course, October 22nd came and went. And those of you who were alive at the turn of millennium, any one of you who were not born yet 
at the turn of millennium. Some of the young ones, perhaps you didn't know, but those who are alive at the turn of millennium, you know what people say, that year 2000 will be the end of the world. The Y2K, when the computers all crash, and then the world will end, because Jesus will come as an IT technician, and we will, I don't know, I don't know how that will work, I don't know how that worked, but this is what people believe. And we know that we are 2018, well, we're all right, you know. And the Watchtower Society, the Jehovah's Witness Bible and Tract Society, made several predictions as well. And we know that we are still here. And to this, Paul simply tells the Thessalonians, you know what? Concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Paul basically says nobody will know. Nobody will know. It will be a sudden thing. And I think we will do better listening to his words as well. And in our first reading, Jesus himself said, Considering that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Even Jesus chose not to know. Jesus chose to submit to the will of the Father in this regard. So, if you know someone who knows, or if you know someone who claims they know, he is either wrong or he is God the Father. Right, So if, if you can safely assume that he is most likely not God the Father, then he must be wrong. Because only the Father knows. And, and it's not wise to seek signs as well, because in verse 3, Paul says, that, Paul says that when people say there is peace and security, and suddenly it happens. When everything seems to be alright, suddenly it happens. A lot of people say that there is this blood moon, that's the sign. Earthquakes here, earthquakes there, that's the sign. Yeah, Jesus says it is the beginning, but Paul also says that, you know, when, when people say there is peace and security, then suddenly it happens. So we will never know. There is no particular signs that we should look for. So Paul says, you don't need to know, we, we cannot know, and there is no sign to it. There are other things, of course, that Jesus says about, about the return, about his return. But Paul says here, you know what? We don't know. No one will know. But when he comes, everyone will know. When he comes, everyone will know. When he comes, no one will miss it. Now, his, first, his second coming will not be like a first coming. In his first coming, he, he did not come as a reigning king with an entourage of angels. Instead, he came as a baby born to a virgin. But in his second coming, when he returns, things will be so much different. He says in Mark 13, In those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. Perhaps that's why people think blood moon. Anyway, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. So when that happens, you will not miss it. Trust me. Apostle John writes that, Provides as well in Revelation chapter 1, he says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. And Apostle Paul says in our passage today, he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That is not an event that you will miss. Trust me. When he, will retu- when he returns, it will be a big hoo-ha. Interestingly, though, many cults will say that Jesus has arrived somewhere in some place. A cult called Shin Cheonji, for example, originated from South Korea. Its founder is Lee Man Hee. He claims that he's the successor of Jesus Christ himself. They call him the Messiah. Now, they're actually actively operating in Melbourne under the name uh, International Bible Study Group or some other names as well. If you have been invited by someone to a Bible study in some obscure place without proper church affiliation, it is probably them. So if you're affected, if you know someone is affected, please talk to me, talk to any other pastors to know more. But that's one of the feature of cult. They said that, oh, we are the in-group. We know that Jesus has arrived somewhere, hiding in the corner somewhere, so you ought to join us. Another cult called Eastern Lightning originated from China. They're also called the Church of Almighty God. The group has been described as a cult and a terrorist organization. And, and, and we actually know a few people who have been affected from the Mandarin congregation as well. According to their beliefs, Jesus has already returned. Again, the same thing, Jesus has already returned. But for, to them, Jesus has already returned disguised as a 30-year-old Chinese female. So look around you. <laughs> if she looks Chinese, 
ask her about her age. If she is hesitant, be suspicious. No, 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 it's okay. Okay, call triple zero anyway. But, uh, but Jesus knew that this would happen. That's why Jesus said, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. Because Jesus knows, Jesus says, and Paul knows that when he comes, nobody will miss it. There is no point for Jesus to hide in the corner somewhere. When he comes, we will all know. So, when they say, when is Jesus coming? When is he coming? Paul simply says to them, you know, we will never know when he will come back. So it is wise not to speculate. It is wise not to buy into any end times prediction. And when he returns, we will all know. When someone says to you that Jesus has returned somewhere, don't believe them. Because when he returns, we will not miss it. It will be a big hoo-ha. Do not be tricked by any false messiahs. All right. So that's clear to the Thessalonians. So the next thing is, meanwhile, what should we do? Meanwhile, what should we do? How should we live? So that's Paul's third point. How should we live now? Should we be checking the sky all the time? Just in case? Because that's, that's what happened to the disciples when Jesus ascended to heaven. They were just waiting. They just go, ooh. And they're just waiting. Ten, nine. And then the angel came, right? Then he says, what are you doing? Go and do some things. Go do some works, right? So we, don't, we are not supposed to check the sky all the time. But what if we are not ready when He returns? What if we are not ready when He comes? What if I'm caught? What if we are caught off guard? What if, what if, what if? To this, Paul tells them, Don't worry. You are not in darkness, brothers, for the day to surprise you like a thief. He's basically saying that you're not in darkness. So that day will not surprise you. That day will not catch you off guard. As long as you are not living in darkness, as long as you are not living like those who are in darkness, trust me, you will not be caught off guard. So the key for Paul, the key to make sure, sorry, the key to making sure that we are ready when he returns is not to fixate about when he will return. Uh, It's good to study the scripture. It's good to read the book of Revelation, to study that, to know a bit more about the characteristics of his, uh, his second coming. But the key to making sure that we are ready is not to fixate over when He returns. We must not keep asking, are we there yet? Is He here yet? Are we there yet? Is He here yet? But Paul tells them instead, the key is to focus on how we live. Rather than when, he says, focus on how we live. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells a parable to illustrate this. There were ten virgins each with an oil lamp, and they're waiting for the bridegroom to arrive. Now, just be careful when you read parables, don't stretch it too far. You might think that, oh, I can have 10 wives. No. (laughs) It's talking that the bridegroom is Jesus, and the, the bride, we are the church, the bride. Okay, so that's a very different context. Five of them were wise because they took extra oil with them, just in case the bridegroom took a long time to arrive. But the other five were foolish. They took no oil with them. And out of the sudden, there was the announcement, the bridegroom has arrived. Then they all got up, but there was a problem. The lambs that belonged to the foolish virgins were out. So they had to rush to the shops to buy more oil. And the wise virgins had no problem. They joined the groom right away. And when the foolish virgins came back from the shops, they were too late. The door was shut. The marriage feast had started and they were too late. And the point of the parable is one thing, which is what Jesus tells them at the end of the parable. He says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Or in Paul's words to the Thessalonians, keep awake and be sober. Keep awake and be sober. And how do you do that? You do that by making sure your lamb keep burning. You know the song, give me all in my lamb, keep me burning. So that's taken from that. And that's what Paul tells the Thessalonians as well. You keep watch. You must make sure you're ready, not by focusing on when, but by focusing on how you live, focusing on keeping your lamp burning. And how do we do that? Paul's answer is simple, although it's not easy to do. His answer is simple. Live like those who live uh, in, not in darkness. And he says, but since we belong to the day, to the day let us be sober Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for helmet 
And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul tells them to put on two things. The breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. Now, if you read Ephesians chapter 6, chapter 6, there are more uh, pieces of the armor of God listed there. But Paul highlighted just two things. Okay, the breastplate protects your chest, protects your heart, while the helmet protects your head, your, your brain, your mind. So Paul is saying, you know, while you live in this world, guard your heart with faith and love. Which means that, you know, if faith refers to your relationship with God, the vertical relationship, and love refers to our relationship with one another, the horizontal relationship, he says, guard your heart with the right relationship with God and the right relationship with one another. And then he says, guard your mind with the hope of salvation. Hope of salvation, of course, refers to trusting in the finished work of Christ. People will try to deceive you with all the false religions, with all the false ways to get right with God. But we stand firm in our conviction, in our renewed mind, that we hope in the finished work of Christ on the cross. So three things appear here, faith, love, and hope. And that's what it means to live as the, as the children of light. So Paul says, as long as you believe in God, as long as you keep the faith, as long as you worship Him and Him only, and as long as you keep on loving people, and as long as you put your hope in Christ alone, if you do these three things as your daily habit in your life, friends, you will always be ready. You will always be ready. And that day, the day of the Lord will never catch you off guard. And Paul closes this section by saying this, Therefore, encourage one another and build one one another up just as you are doing. Again, the commandments are in present imperative. Keep on encouraging one another. Keep on building one another up. And he also says, just as you are doing. Just as you are doing doing now one of the icebreaker questions that i come across quite often and i use that from time to time is this if jesus were to come back tomorrow what would you do in the next 24 hours if jesus were to come back tomorrow what would you do in the next 24 hours think about that for a second what would you do some will say i will spend all my money and tick as many items as possible from my bucket list some will say i'll start telling everyone the gospel Some will say, I'll move my wedding date much earlier. Okay, anyway. (laughs) And some will say, for the next 23 and a half hours, I will do all the sinful things I've been tempted to do, and then I will confess them all in the last half an hour. (laughs) Go crazy. But chances are many people will do something rather radical, right? Now, of course, of course, you will do something a bit different than your usual rhythm of life. I don't think you will go to work. I don't think so. But if, if the things that you decided to do are drastically and dramatically different from how you live now, perhaps, perhaps you're living not in light of the return of Jesus. If they are extremely, extremely the opposite from how we are living now, then friends, I'm afraid that we might not be ready when Jesus comes. That's why Paul says, just as you are doing, just as you are doing. If somehow there's this information, there's this tweet, right, saying that Jesus is coming tomorrow, and suddenly you panic and start to do things that are opposite, then I think Paul is saying, you have been living wrongly. You have been living wrongly. So Paul is saying, just as you're doing, as long as you keep doing what you're doing right now, as long as you keep on encouraging one another to keep the faith, encouraging one another to continue loving one another, encourage one another to stay hopeful in Christ, then you will be ready when Jesus returns. Don't get, fix, don't get fixated on when, but focus on how you live. Keep watch and keep your lamp burning. So, Let's bring all this together. So Paul is saying to them, you know, as Christians, we can grieve over the death of our loved one. We should grieve because death is not right. But at the same time, we don't grieve as if we have no hope. We don't grieve as if death is the end. We have hope precisely because Jesus has died and He has risen again. 
We have hope because Jesus will bring us all together with him when he returns. To us, death is not goodbye. To us, death is see you again. But at the same time, at the same time, don't get fixated on when he will return. Don't be deceived by people or signs. Rather, focus on how you live. Are we living as children of light? Are we living as a sober, watchful, and alert children of the day? Are we being, or are we being complacent? And, and if you're not a Christian, friends, if you're not a Christian, let me ask you this question. Where do you put your hope after your life on earth is over? Where do you put your hope after your life on earth is over? Just yesterday, uh, after, after ISM, I, went, I drove home and I listened to a podcast. And uh, the president of Evangelism Explosion was speaking to Ed Stetzer. He's a, a researcher uh, about Christianity stuff. And his research, his survey indicated that one out of five people, one out of five people, thinks about what happens after death quite regularly, one out of five. So chances are, if there are five people sitting next to you, maybe one of them are thinking about that constantly. So I don't know whether you are doing that or not, whether you're thinking of that or not, but my guess is, well, quite a, quite a, a number of you are d- thinking about that. Where do you put your hope after your life on earth is over? So if you're not a Christian, friends, you've got to know that Jesus died. And he has risen again, and that's historical truth. So if there is anyone who if there is anyone who knows about life and death, if there's anyone who can defeat death, if there's anyone who has the key to eternal life, it will be Jesus. Many founders of religions have come and gone, but they stay dead. Only Jesus has risen from the dead. Nobody else did. Nobody else does. And the same Jesus said this in John chapter 5, verse 28 to 29. He says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Death is not the end. Everyone will be raised in the end. Whether you are Christian or not, everyone will be raised. But some will be raised to the resurrection of life, but some will be raised to the resurrection of judgment. So friends, death is not the end. And this is not my word. If this is my word, I think you can just go home and continue doing whatever you're doing. Nothing should change in your life. And this is not the words of your Christian friends either. This is the word of Christ, of Christ who has defeated death. So friends, I started by asking, how much of what you know really has an impact on your life? Friends, I hope that this truth has and will have a huge impact on your life. It is a matter of life or death. It is a matter of hell or heaven. So don't ignore it, please. Don't ignore it. Come to Him. Believe in Him. Trust in Him. Repent from your sins. Make, it that, make that 180 degree from your old, li- old life. Follow Jesus. And friends, when you do and when He returns, you will be glad that you did. Come to Him. Don't delay. I'll pray and we'll take questions. Father, we thank You, Lord, for the revelation that You have given to Paul and to many writers of the Scripture about the fact that You you will return, Jesus. And thank You, Lord, for comforting us, for encouraging us that as long as we live as children of the day, we will not, we don't have, we don't need to fear that that we will be caught off guard. So, Father, I help us to focus on how we live now, not, not, to, get, not to get fixated on, on when He will return, but to focus on encouraging one another to stay hopeful, to stay faithful, and to stay loving. And we pray, Father, that when Jesus returns, Lord, He will find faith in us, and we will join Him in the air to join Him in eternal life, to the resurrection of life. And I pray for those who are who are not yet Christian, who those who do not believe in Jesus, who do not trust in Jesus yet. I pray, Father, that, that you will draw them to yourself, Lord. Lord, pray that this, this truth will come alive in them and they will make the necessary adjustment in their lives to trust you, to run to you, to seek for your forgiveness and to follow you, Lord. And, and then we will join together in the end when he returns. Thank you, Father. So we pray that we will continue to love and encourage one another here at Cross Culture, while we live here on earth. 
until he returns. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.